Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Fine Film. Yeah. You going or am I going? Um, I, I can go to start off. Uh, cool. 2024 with a bang. Um, 2024. Oh, man. I know, it's it still sounds like a sci-fi future. movie. Um, yeah. I w- I w- now that I said that, I kind of wish that I had used the word bang, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, the word I chose was fine. Which, Ooh. so somebody responded to, speaking of social media, which won't make any sense to anyone listening, because I think I'll start the episode when we started talking about words. We were talking about social media before we started recording. And <laughs> somebody um, somebody on Twitter asked if we had ever done the word fine. And I, my first thought was, yeah, we have. And then I, I looked at it and I said, no, we haven't <laughs> for some reason. But I was positive. That we that we had, like I dismissed it out of hand. Consolation. Literally every time I'm researching a word for this podcast, I sort of I have my kind of process, and and I I get there's only so far into the process I get before I then go to our website and check that we haven't yeah. done this word already. And yeah. we like I, I I don't know how many words in total we've done, um, but I I for some reason. You, you could like there are some that are really memorable and yeah. some that i just uh, i'll go back and be like oh you did that word i wonder if it was <laughs> me or ryan who talked about that like i genuinely yeah. just don't remember yeah it's it's been a couple hundred words like so that makes me feel a little bit better i feel like that's fair yeah um, I try to pay attention <laughs> i pay attention in the moment what more do you want from me <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, I, I was like, "Well, turns out we haven't." So I will, and it was the the context of the question on Twitter was, "What is going on with this word that can mean so many different things?" Because you could say, "I'm fine," or "That's fine," as in acceptable, mm-hmm. but a kind of middle of the road, you know, meh. It can also mean delicate or expensive or refined like the finer things of life Mm -hmm. uh it could be a charge or a penalty a monetary a parking fine library fines like what is happening with this good question i thought so too and so uh the word shows up in english by the beginning of the 1300s and this is one of those words that it has definitively weakened over time because right at the beginning we have it as an adjective an adverb and a noun with a meaning of quote of a quality or attribute perfect pure genuine utter or sheer and this meaning is absolute so fine has absolutely uh weakened and lessened over time yeah yeah very much so um the earliest attribution for it in the oed is uh, the adjective sense of it with an adverb following close behind, which makes a lot of sense that those would be more or less interchangeable. And this was similar to what we have on the, in terms of like fine art or a fine wine type of sense. Mm-hmm. But, but again, the obsolete use was the absolute furthest extreme of perfection. Like there was no... Um, you would never use the finer things because fi- no- like like unique there there is no yeah. gradient it's it's binary Ooh. there's okay there's dead pregnant and fine things you either <laughs> are or are not and that's the thing <clears throat> and so um again <laughs> very different the noun uh, to use the word fine as a noun is very rare it shows up much later on in the 1300s, never really catches on, but was sort of 
it would encapsulate the noun that the word fine would be describing once that's already understood, if that makes any sense. So um, the English playwright John Ford is the um, author of one of the citations of this in a play called The Lady's Trial, where it basically means beautiful, a beautiful woman, a fine lady. And the line is, fairs, fines, and honeys are but flesh and blood. So the fines there is fine women. Okay. Perfect yeah. women. Which is also interesting because if you had asked anyone when the first time women were referred to as honeys, I bet they wouldn't think of the English playwright John Ford in the ladies' trial in the, I think it's 15th hundreds. But <laughs> there we have it. Well, they should, quite frankly. <laughs> they should, exactly. Um, and it was also referred to the the best part of something. So the fine of the wool would be used oh. to make the best quality sweaters. Or the fine okay. of the meat would be the most desirable cuts of meat. Um, the best time of the day was the fine of the day. I that sort of thing. That. I also like that. I was a big fan of that. Um, interestingly, also at the beginning of the 1300s, we have citations for fine meaning as a noun, meaning a sum of money. So, okay. quote, a sum of money exacted as the penalty for an offense, especially by a court of law or other authority. So, it's interesting that that sort of confusion goes back not confusion, but dual meaning goes back pretty much to the beginning in English. And is there any sense that the the, the sum of money has a fineness about it, or is it just one of these quirks of etymology where the same word is used for these two quite different things? We will get there. I promise there's a oh, resolution. Oh, I see. So You know me, Ryan. Impatient I... as always. <laughs> <laughs> Originally... It, um, it before specifically meaning a, a sum of money or a monetary penalty, it would usually mean just a penalty, just any oh. sort of punishment. So it's like, but, give us all your good stuff. E sort of. <laughs> Again, sort of. Um, and then eventually it was, it, the money was instead of another punishment. Like you'd be facing this other punishment, but you could, you could wrap it up by giving us this money and then we'll call it done. Okay. Um, an obsolete use in the early 1300s was in a situation of a, a tendency where there, there would be rent, which is the ongoing money you're paying to lease a, a, a place, a, a residence or whatever. But there was also a fine, which was like a, a bunch of money that changed hands to start a tendency to, like, to create that arrangement uh, Okay. to enter into that contract. The thing that I thought of was... Uh, you remember in Korea, they had this thing called key money, which yeah. is why everyone got their apartments from the schools they worked at because nobody yeah. could go over there and afford to shell out thousands of dollars for the privilege of renting an apartment, even if you were going to get that money back. Yeah, I forgot so, all about that. Um, I think key money might have been in Korea might have been a a deposit rather than just like a a, a fee, a charge. Mm -hmm. This seems to be, have been. A charge, like you give Just money. Yeah, okay. So. Landlords, um, dickheads since the beginning of time. <laughs> yeah. A little later on, we start getting into one of my favorite things, which is the verbing of adjectives and nouns. Yes. And then that's where you get to fine someone is to uh, apply a fine to them as a punishment. Mm -hmm. And then so, or to find something by making it pure or clarified or better in some way to improve it. So both right. of those things okay. had were verbed. Yeah. And then it, it just kind of kept, kept weakening over time, right? It, when you start at the top, there's no way to go but down kind of thing. <laughs> you, you could only weaken when you start with the absolute sheer utmost of perfection. You're, you're, you're kind of asking for it at that point. So now we still get things that do mean good, like a fine wine is, there's nothing ironic about that use, but if someone says, you know, if you ask how someone is and they say, I'm fine, you, you know, they're lying, but they're being polite about it. Except, um, apparently so, in German, 
apparently in Germany, people are very confused by British people. Because if you ask a German person how they are, they will tell you. Right. Like I think I remember seeing this somewhere in a German show or something where they talk they, about they'll, this. They'll tell you if things are really great and they'll also say that things are going really badly and everything's terrible. Which, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, obviously I come from, from the land of, of absolute social repression. But, <laughs> like, I... I yeah. It's one of, one of my favourite conversation incidental conversations i've ever had with another human being it made me laugh so much i once many years ago now ran into a guy who i was at school with now when i say i was at school like we were at playgroup together age three right. and then we joined the same class at school age five and we did primary school from five to twelve and then we were at secondary school together from like 12 to at least 16 18 whatever and we <laughs> we were never like great friends, but we knew you know we knew we had known each other a long time. Yeah, of course. Anyway, after a break of a, about at least ten years, I ran into him in a pub in Dundee. Right. And he was like, "Hey," and I was like, "Hey, how are you? How are you?" Da, 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 chat, 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 chat. And he said to me, "How are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I th- I think it was one of the times when my mum was was quite ill." And I right. was like, well, yeah. you know, like, and, and he said, oh, whoa, 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 Amy, please bear in mind, I have asked you this question, safe in the knowledge that you are going to tell me that you are fine. And I was <laughs> like, dude, I am so sorry. What was I thinking? You're yeah. absolutely right. We haven't seen each other for like a decade. Yeah. We're going to have this conversation and then move on with our lives. I'm fine. Would you like a drink? <laughs> exactly. How are you? Not so well. I'm sorry. What I meant was hello. Yeah. That's what I, I meant. I, it was just like, I, I was so happy because that is how social interactions should be. You know? Yeah. I can't be doing with, but I'm supposed to think this and this person said this and that probably means that they mean this thing, but maybe they mean that thing. Like that, that fries my brain. It's so much better when people just go... Can you be fine for the purposes of this conversation? Because I don't care that much. I'm not here to invest yeah. anything into this. Yeah. Just, I'm going to enjoy it. Let's have a pint. And then we're going to go our separate ways. Done. Perfect. Yeah. The end. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now we arrive to the part of the podcast where you get an actual answer to your various completely fair questions about... <laughs> About fine. I could have just waited and asked now. It's it's fine. It's not who I am as a human being, is it? No, not really. It's it's just not. That's it's one of the ways I would be able to tell almost immediately that you've been replaced by some sort of doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> like would if AI I, Amy do that, probably I don't have any real way to connect directly with Ross communications wise. <laughs> but if I made it through an entire segment and you didn't say anything, I would be looking for one so that I could just be like, hey, dude, is everything all right over there? Is everything okay? Have you checked the room where Amy is, quote unquote, recording a podcast? Because she's building a device of some sort with her spare time, like, because this isn't right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's fair. <laughs> so we're looking at the etymology now. Surprise, surprise. And it comes from uh, French. And this okay. is where we find out that it, why it starts from such an ultimate, unequivocal place. And it's because it quite simply comes from the French word fin, meaning end, or more grimly, death. Oh, as in the end of a French film. Fin. Fin, exactly. So that's why when, when you describe something, it's the ultimate extreme of the quality that you're looking at. Like the, oh, I love that. That's the brilliant. The progression of good dies after this thing because you've reached the pinnacle like when something is the last word the last yes. word in fashion the exactly last word in beauty great yep the final the final word yeah exactly and that's why it's also the penalty punishment because it brings the dispute to an end ah, it's, this is how you course. make this go away this is how you kill this argument this is how you absolve yourself and this can be done it can get relegated to the past now through a fine. That's awesome. I like that a lot. 
yeah, it's, it's, it's neat. Um, and so it, the rest, once you know that, then you start going back and you can kind of retcon things and reverse engineer most of the uses. So like a, a fine line is sort of the furthest you can take the thinness of a thing while still being visible. Yeah. Or, or fine particles, you know, like you get that sense of the ultimate extreme of whatever it is you're talking about. So I thought that was neat. That's super and, cool. And then I thought, you know, who might have some really interesting words to say about fine? Aww. What with its so many Smith. synonyms? Smith. 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 It's Smith. 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 <laughs> so he has fine. Uh, for those who don't know, again, this is the eminently Googleable Charles Smith. Thanks very much, history. Um, <laughs> who was a reverend who wrote a book in a year. I don't remember which one, but it was definitely in one of the years um, in ye olden times. <laughs> a book was written in a year. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to apologize to our listeners for the dry academic I know. detail <laughs> that, that we you know that we persist in getting I know it must be so tiresome to, slow to down to nerd to fact after fact after fact <laughs> yeah there have been millions of books written in English and this was one of them and <laughs> it was called synonyms discriminated in which he goes and says you think these are synonyms but here's how they're different but he oh. says it in deliciously gulpable language and it's awesome I'm so so happy to, to start off 2024 with some smithing it's it's pretty great. I'm a big fan. So the first time fine is discriminated is in the entry alongside beautiful, handsome, pretty, and lovely. Okay. So Smith says, quote, fine seems to have taken to itself by usage a force not originally belonging to it. The fine, being the slender or highly finished, as we speak of a fine line, has come to mean also that which is not little, and implies a certain degree of size and conspicuousness. In short, it is opposite to coarse, which is the same thing as coarse equals current or ordinary. Okay. And hence denotes that which is no ordinary thing of its kind, thus involving characteristic excellences and excluding specific defects. Beauty involves a degree of fineness, which prettiness excludes. Softness and symmetry without size are the characteristics of prettiness. A pretty landscape is pleasing. Beautiful scenery is strikingly attractive. Fine scenery may be beautiful, but contains also elements of the bold and grand. Beautiful thoughts have a loftiness and power of sentiment and expression. Fine thoughts are elevating and clothed in choice expressions. Pretty ideas have a clever or unsubstantial grace, which fits them for versification. End quote. Do you know, do you know what I love about Smith? <sighs> is it everything? I mean, there are, there's so much to love about Smith. But Smith just feels like the sorted out one. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, he just knows. He just, this is what this word means. I have decided. It has been sorted out and put to bed. Fam. <laughs> yeah, end. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... that's just glorious. It, yeah, I like it a lot. That's as, dis as discriminated from beautiful, handsome, pretty lovely. Um, the other place that he has an entry for fine is in the same grouping as delicate and nice. Okay. And um, he keeps to his understanding of fine as denoting some ultimate or uncommonly pronounced quality. And so he says, fine has, singularly enough, taken to itself a meaning quite, a, quite opposed to the weakness of delicacy, though it is nearly identical with it in its other senses of requiring minuteness of discrimination or exhibiting discriminative power as a fine distinction. There would appear at first sight to be almost a contradiction between such uses of the term as fine cambric and a fine child, the former pointing to delicacy of texture, the latter to robustness of constitution. But <laughs> fine, as opposed to coarse, which is the same as coarse, i.e. ordinary, and so meaning choice of its kind, will admit of such seemingly contrarian applications. A fine child is a child of no common form and growth. Fine cambric is of no common texture. A fine taste is a taste of no common power of discrimination. End quote. So that's... Good things come in many shapes and sizes. The thing that makes them all good is their goodness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great. 
so that's uh yeah so there there you have it there's fine and that's why it can mean uh really great really thin really big really dead or <laughs> a parking fee <laughs> Yeah, that's that's excellent. Yeah, wow, it's pretty excellent. Fine. I like it. Good stuff. Oh, I just there's there's something about Smith that just makes me want to sit for a minute. Yeah, like you kind of though, just soak it in. Beautiful sprinkly dust that's just going to settle and go. <sighs> yeah, they do kind of hang there for a bit, you know. Like that's that's what I always yeah. think. I'm a big fan. <sighs> Well, I I have a I have a, a word to talk about today that okay. is well we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to address something first because when <laughs> okay. I tell you this word, I will invariably almost without meaning to do it, I will pronounce it one way. And then for pretty much the whole rest of the time that I'm talking about it, I will pronounce it a different way. Oh, I'm excited. Okay. And I, 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 it's not it's not that exciting. But we we got an email recently from Cara. Thank you so much for your email. It was very lovely, and we love to hear from you. Yes. Um, and it pointed out that it pointed out that I'm a foreigner and that I sound funny. <laughs> Only from here. <laughs> not in any not in any you know pejorative or or unkind way by yeah. any means, but uh, you know. There's a lot more people who don't have Scottish accents out there than people who do have Scottish accents out there. And I feel intensely True. privileged to be one of those people. So, um, Cara made the point that, that in one of one of the episodes, that I, did, I think it was a solo episode where I was talking about pirates and she initially thought I was talking about buccaneers because yeah. she, uh, she, she then went on to, to explain in her email that when she says pie as in Proto-Indo-European, when she says pie, it rhymes with I. And so when, when Ryan <laughs> shared this email with me, I was like, well, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I pronounce both those words differently to the way that I, I believe uh, I believe Cara is not just from the US, but from the South. And so, yes. you know, you can imagine the way that I say those words and the way that she likely says these words is going to be quite different. So... Um, and and th that made me laugh. Uh, that made me laugh quite a lot. Yeah. But it did give me cause to think that when I say this word in terms of my word today is da da da, it's going to be different when I actually say it when I'm talking about it. Because as is my habit when researching words, I use the things that are around. You know, I love lamp. Uh, <laughs> right. The yeah, I yeah. love lamps uh, method of of choosing words to research and. During the great uh, between Christmas and New Year abyss, I have watched a lot, like a lot of films, tons <laughs> of them. So much telly, so much film. There's been loads. Of, you know, we, we've we've talked often. We talk often about how there's there are currently more good things to watch out there than any of us has time to watch. Yeah. Um. So so yeah, this has been like a, a four film day. That's that's kind of reasonable to me. At, wow. At this point nice. in time. And um, and I don't apologise for that because no, sometimes you just want to sit your ass down and not say anything for a few hours. So that that's been good. And yeah, I find myself curious about the word film. Okay? Oh, cool. F I L M. Okay. But the first thing I have to point out is that I will, as I get on to talking about this word, it will suddenly grow in syllables because <laughs> film is how I would generally pronounce it. Nice. And yeah. This is actually, but before I even start talking about the word, I I feel like it is salient to talk about this feature because it's a feature that I I didn't know had a name until really quite recently, and it was pointed out by the very excellent Len Penny, who if you, if you don't follow her on the various oh, social must. media places to follow, please please remedy that very quickly. If you have even a passing interest in the Scots language and the way that I talk and people like people who sound like me then she has a scots word of the day uh instagram tiktok uh probably on facebook too that that sort of thing twitter yeah and she uh, she's also very funny very clever i i i like her a lot bit of a fan girl going on here um she's she's awesome and she pointed out svarabakti vowels and you know 
I'm not the sort of person who can hear a word like Svarabhakti without going, oh. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was curious to start off with. And then when I just when I discovered what a Svarabhakti vowel is, I was even more delighted because it's it's ours. It's one of the things that we do. So Svarabhakti is actually a feature of Sanskrit, as the you know, as the, the word suggests. And basically yeah. Svarabhakti vowels nope, start again. Svarabhakti <laughs> Vowels, not Svarabhakti vowels. I don't even know what I said there. I don't even anyway, know what's going on anymore. Okay. Is when you add an extra, so when you say film or arum, as we do in Scotland, or poem, and all these other words that if I was a, a, a received pronunciation speaker of, of the Queen's English, I would say film and arm and poem and things like that. But because yeah. I'm Scottish, I don't. They get an extra syllable. And this, uh, so it's, it's known as Svarabhakti vowels, but also the, the sort of broader name is epenthesis, which is quite a lovely word by itself. And you, you can look that up epenthesis. There's, you know, there, there's a whole lot of complicated linguistic stuff going on within um, within epenthesis. Essentially, it's, it's the insertion of a sound within a word. It's so, E-P-E, right? That's how yeah, you spell that's it? Yeah, right. If people were to look it up? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so one of the, the, the definition that I'm looking at here actually comes from the Scottish Gaelic grammar wiki because Gaelic is a, a language that uses a penthesis and I believe this is why we do it in Scots because, um, you know, the, the two languages have rubbed off against each other. And so, for example, the, the Gaelic word for Scotland is spelled A-L-B-A, but it's pronounced Alaba. Oh, okay. So that extra syllable that's put there in the middle is an example of a penthesis or a Svarabhakti, a Svara... My God, why is this so difficult? It was going so well, a Svarabhakti vowel, um, which is something that I'm probably going to use as I talk about the word film. There you go. <laughs> And as Len Penny often points out, it's it's one of these features of Scots that sometimes people judge. You know, um, if you if you use epenthesis, then maybe you're not as not as clever or not as intelligent, or you know, there's a sort of a there's a social kind of shading within that. Um, but I really enjoy saying the word film, so I'm going to carry on doing that. Well, it's interesting though as well because it's I, I'm. I'm not sure if it is a heritage thing in my family, but it's not a, it's not all that uncommon in North American dialects as well. But it seems to be randomly sprinkled through the populace. Yeah, I love that. Like you you won't really get, I don't think, <clears throat> like an area where they say film or onion instead of onion. But like my <laughs> grandfather said film and he would say onion. And you like mm-hmm. you get these just and it's very interesting because it seems to almost be individualistic here. Yeah. And so, but it's it's definitely not limited to Scots, but you can have it as an origin point. I'm happy for that. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not in any way limited to Scots. It's the, the well, it's main Wikipedia article <laughs> yeah. on epenthesis talks about its usage in, in standard English and Finnish and Japanese and, and a whole wide interest in range of languages. I would I would encourage you to go and, and dig a little bit deeper if, if that's the sort of thing that makes you happy, um, as it is me. But I, I didn't want to go into it in tons and tons and tons of detail uh, yeah. because you'd think I'd been replaced by a robot. So <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> But yes, so film. Uh, film is a much, much older word than I was expecting it to be because, of course, I think, you know, we kind of often have this with words where you shorthand straight to a single definition of a word, which, of course, has many definitions because right. the first citation in the, the OED of the word film is, in fact, in early Old English. Whoa. Yeah. However, in this particular usage, it means a thin layer or sheet of tissue in an animal or plant or in a product of an animal or plant. They, they refer to it right. as a pellicle or a membrane. Now, this is now quite a rare usage for that particular word, but you can think of, you know, a film of tissue or a film well, of, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, a sheet of tissue. Um, like, uh, as you say, in an onion, uh, that would be an example of a, a pellicle, a single sheet of onion skin. Uh, it's very, very thin and it, it has the appearance of skin and um, 
and we would refer to that as a film. Right. And so we have we have early Old English, Old English, then we get it in 1400, 1440, all the way through the centuries, uh, up until the, the latest that's given in the OED is from 2010. Remove the film covering the brain and any sinews or veins. So just, you know, using it to generally talk about sort of connective tissue within the body. Right. And... Um, the the second usage again we get the same idea there, there's uh, sorry but before I go on to the second usage there's a wonderful feature now you know that we were upset when the OED had its kind of upgrade change around thing um, yeah, but I, I don't know if you've investigated there is a, a great little drop down menu next to the definitions that gives you a historical thesaurus entry I have not spent nearly enough time with the historical thesaurus in general with the OED but yeah so just this is this is what it gives you. I, I noticed this little drop down and I clicked on it. And um, so we have film, a thin layer or sheet of tissue, and then we have next to it skinlet from fifteen ninety eight. Thin skin or a membrane. I quite enjoyed thin skinlet. Excuse me. Yeah. And then veil, as in the, the palatine veil, the veil across the palate in anatomy. Um, so yeah, quite quite nice to to get those. At the time when people were using these words like this, they were also using words like this to mean a similar thing. There you are. I've just mansplained historical thesaurus to the whole world. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> right. So the the second usage for the words uh, film is the foreskin. It means the foreskin. This is also obsolete. The two citations given are only in Old English. But again, you know, given that, that first meaning, it's, it's pretty reasonable to see that that meaning would be given Um in that particular context. Again, another obsolete and rare one, a single citation from around about 1656. A film, uh, it's a lovely, a lovely quote, this loose and busy film which we carry in our mouths. It means the tongue. Oh, interesting. We then get um, the idea of an abnormal layer of tissue or pus or something like that covering the surface of the eye or the eyelid, or, you know, the idea that there's something covering over the eye and there's a, a thick film covering it. Um, and then very quickly, we also get the sense of, sort of figurative sense. So a figurative obscuring of vision. The OED right. says it could be caused by an emotion or an experience, for example. You know, this evil spirit instantly spreadeth a film over their eyes, caused them not to see clearly. Um, which which is quite lovely. From 1577, we have a fine skin sheet or covering forming a thin layer or coating on a, on a surface, a fine thread or filament, as of gossamer silk, a thin sheet of any substance. Uh, this one's particularly lovely. It says in philosophy, the citation given here is from 1682, in ancient atomism, any of the extremely fine layers of atoms which are constantly being emitted from bodies and which, acting on the human sense organs, cause sense perception. Interesting. So we have um, from 1682, images of things which like thin films from bodies rise in streams. And then we have in 2009, perception occurs when a stream of these films is received by the mind, either directly or through the sense organs. It's quite lovely. We get the sense of a, a mist or a haze, again, to do with this idea of obscuring something. Um, a superficial overlay of a quality, so another figurative use. Um, a film thrown over convenient injustice. Then we get to cling film or plastic film, the transparent material used to wrap up food or, you know, whatever else you're wrapping up with cling film. I believe right. cling film is not a term that's used in uh, on your side of the pond. Uh, no, it's, it's generally, it's either, it's sort of a, oh shoot, but what's the word for when the brand name becomes just the name of the thing? Yeah, it's a generonym. Generonym, yeah. So often saran wrap will be what people call it. Just that's ah, okay, the, got you. The brand, but also plastic wrap. You hear cling film every now and then, but it's not as common. At least not oh, okay. in my part of Canada. Yeah, fair enough. Um, when do you think the first sense... It's, so there's a whole section here in senses relating to photography and cinematography. Oh. Uh, I'm... I have a feeling it's going to be 1870. 
close. 1840. Oh man, that's even. Yeah. We must separate carefully the chemical changes which iodide of silver undergoes in the sunbeam from the mechanical changes which happen to the sensitive film. So, cool. a, a thin layer of light sensitive material. And of course, this, this then gives us um, eventually, from about 1899, we get the, the representation of a thing recorded on film. So, um, the. A, a film of the Spanish-American Civil War, for example, is, is, is given. Right. The, sorry, yeah. the Spanish-American War, um, or, or the Oberammergau Passion Play, uh, and the film becomes the event or experience of the thing, in, in the sense that, that we kind of use now. And then by 1915, we have the, the idea of the art of the film. So so this the mass noun of the making of films as an industry or as a, a genre or as an art form. That's still very early. Yeah, well, again, the the verb, much earlier than, than I was considering. Now, if we think about the meanings that I've, that I've gone through there, obviously the, the verb is, the earliest verb is not about, you know, shooting a movie, but um, it's from 1604. Whoa. It will but skin and film the viscerous place. Right. So to cover okay. something with a thin layer or a film. Um, is what we get and then that sense of the the eyes being covered over with a film so to film over or to film with horror that sort of right. thing and then we get to um again the the first the first verb as in to film to make a visual representation is from 1899 which is quite magical professors yeah. of medicine are filming their patients muscles so um by the by 1913, the, the 20s, the 30s, we're using that term in exactly the same way that, that we use now, you know, filming a play or looking, watching a film, that kind of thing. Right. And I use the word movie there uh, as, as I was explaining that. I still feel quite, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. You know, I'm, I'm not a language prescriptivist anymore definitely lean more towards language hippie than grammar nazi and yeah <laughs> language changes and, and you know there's there's good reasons for it to, to do so but yeah i really really cling to the sense that over here we say film and over your side people don't tend to say film so i would talk about watching a film as in putting on a right two hour long story cinematic of, experience yeah yeah but I think that um, I think that movie is becoming more common, and there's there's some stubborn, curmudgeonly part of me that's like, no, it's not a movie, it's a film, damn it. Uh, right. And I, I I don't really know why that is. But, I think um, over here it's there's uh, I think it's a I think it's a marker of whether or not you're a nerd about it. <laughs> like Transformers was a movie. If you find oh, someone yeah. who went to Transformers and called it a film, you would think they were bonkers. <laughs> but you would you would use film if you're trying to describe a, a, a movie you've seen here, and you you want to convey that it is not your blockbuster Hollywood blah blah blah. It's got some depth to it. It's got some nuance. It's maybe a little bit boring at times. Oh, you would no, say, it's, am, I, "Am I just someone who wants to show off how clever I am?" It's a. I have no idea. This is a film. <laughs> it's, it's a good film but you, you'd definitely be marking something when you said that but if it's in casual yeah in casual conversation if you're talking about just sitting down and watching a two hour whatever you, you're gonna watch a movie yeah yeah so to the etymology yes and it's uh well i, I discovered some some rather lovely things as it was going so first of all it's inherited from Germanic, the, the OED says. You know, so we have um, Old Frisian and Middle Dutch uh, examples given. But ultimately, it's a Proto-Indo-European root. So that's pi, which rhymes with I, however you happen to pronounce <laughs> those two words. Um, nice. And the, the pi root is uh, listed by both Etym Online and the University of Texas at Austin Indo-European Pokorni Language Etymon Index yep. <laughs> as PEL, P-E-L. And okay. the, the OED notes, this is such a lovely word, it says it's the same Indo-European base as the ancient Greek, Greek 
pelma, P-E-L-M-A, which means the sole of the foot. And then it says, see, pelmatogram. Oh. Isn't that just a delicious word? That is great. Pelmatogram. And it's one of these straightforward, good old fashioned etymological, does what it says on the tin. A pelmatogram is a print with your feet. of the foot. Footprint. How lovely. I'm... I feel like... I feel like oh. sometimes it's worth just having these very old-fashioned, incredibly niche words. They, they just they tickle me. I love them. I'm going to make a real effort to say palmatogram instead of footprint from now on. Yeah. I, At least I, intermittently. So, so palmatogram um, and the sense of pel, the pirate means skin or hide, which oh, okay. makes perfect sense when, when you consider that a film is largely plant yeah. or animal uh, thin piece of that um, and, and that's been the case since ever people used skins and hides which is well it's, it's quite a long time ago I'm led to believe forever yeah um, so some of the cognates listed on it, Etym Online uh, there's the, the wonderful erysipelas which oh. is a skin disease and it's another one of these beautiful Greek does what it says on the tin words because the uh, eri part comes from erythros, which means red, and the pel part means skin. And it is a disease also known as St. Anthony's fire, which gives you red inflamed skin. So erysipelas, um, it also gives us fell, a noun which means the skin or hide of an animal. It gives us film. It gives us pellagra and pellicle. So pellagra is a, the, the disease that um, it's a, di a dietary deficiency um, that I believe you can get from eating grain and only grain, rice and only rice. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. But again, it's, it's characterised by dry red skin. So it's the skin part here. We then get the word pellicle, which again, a, a membrane or a thin skin that could easily have been in the historical thesaurus. And uh, pellicle made me, it, it rang a very, very small educational bell way back in my mind um, when I was a schoolgirl learning French. And for some reason it stuck with me that the French word pellicule, les pellicules, uh, is the French word for dandruff. Oh, nice. So it literally means uh, the skins, the little skins, <laughs> which is, of course, exactly what sits on your shoulders if you're unlucky enough to have dandruff. So um, a pelt, all, all these uh, pelty right, type words course, have to yeah. do skins or hides. Then the, the very nice uh, pillion, which is a word I always, I've always really liked. Uh, do you know what pillion means? I feel like I probably once did, but I no longer do. So you can ride pillion on a motorcycle, for example. Oh. And pillion, pillion on a motorcycle means to, to ride on the back, like to, to not be the main driver, but to, to sit behind that person. Right. And you can also ride pillion on a horse. And I thought that the word just meant, it just referred to being the second person on that setup. Right. But in researching this word, I discovered that it is, in fact, a type of light, simple saddle. So oh, okay. it's, it's not the position that you're in. It's the saddle that you're sitting on that makes you pillion. A pillion saddle was especially for women. Um, the word comes from around about 1500s and comes again from pelis, Latin, meaning skin or pelt. Uh, so an adjustable pad or a cushion behind the saddle as a seat for a second person. It, it's, it's usually a woman. I don't know if that's because women weren't allowed to drive even then or you know, <laughs> or if it was yeah. just um, about comfort. No, no idea. Don't know enough about riding to, to give you that. But yeah. I, I always like it when you discover a word that you thought you knew the meaning of turns out to have actually a, a slightly different meaning. Uh, the European of European. What am I talking about? The University of Austin um, has these these similar similar list of cognates. We get uh, film. There's also because whoever it is that's composed this list, they've got a Tolkien nerd in there somewhere. And Hasufel, who is Aragon's horse in Tolkien, the fell part of that name um, is the pell part of, right. of this root. Um, 
We also get pelisse, which is a lovely word, a long coat or a cloak made or lined with fur. Um, peltate, this is such a good word. Peltate means shield shaped. But again, oh. that pell part comes from the idea of a, a, a fur or a skin. And also both Etam Online and uh, University of Texas note that surplus, the loose white outer vestment worn by clergymen, right, yeah, uh, yeah. also has it has its its roots in pell, That's the, the proto-European okay. root that gives us film. So from uh, church dress to animal skins to riding to pieces of entertainment that last anywhere between a few minutes up to a couple of hours, those are films. Nice. <laughs> With a wee bit of acti thrown in just, just for fun. Absolutely. I think one big lesson we can all take from this is if we are ever transported back to old English times, do not talk about your film collection. Because <laughs> they will have questions. I don't know. I think I'd uh, rather I'd do well striking fear into the hearts of medieval men. Well, yes, but also if you said film collection. I would explain that they were uh, lined up on a shelf, alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then you just take one down and look at it for two hours. Yeah, just watch it for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> Gather Divide friends and family around. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is, this is it. It's like when I... When I when I used to teach, um, and I used to teach Jekyll and Hyde, and eventually, at some point in the in the kind of study and, and analysis of the text, I would point out the oft discussed homosexual reading of the of the text, and I would always say, I know that whatever else I've taught you up until this point, this is the only thing you're going to remember. Please, God, don't write about it in your essays if you're going to write about nothing else. <laughs> yeah. But I am going to point this out because it is something that you might come across when you're reading. So I, I can tell you all about all these various other things. And all Ryan's got in his head is, hey, hey, hey foreskin. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm a simple and human. I wouldn't have you any other way. That's right. Yeah. There's, this is that highbrow, lowbrow dichotomy of this podcast that we always talk so much about um, i don't know i mean do we we don't get that high do we no. no there was a book written in a year foreskin titmouse teehee you know that kind of thing that's very cool i it, it makes so much sense wait like all these things make so much sense in retrospect because you already know about them but yeah as soon as like the, the it at first it's st like the old english thing the fact that it goes that far back i was like whoa yeah but then it was like well of course if if once you separate it once it's like no 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 the film is the material that it's on and it's analogous to there might be a film on a pond or something you might see a thin film of something on top of the water or something like that and it's like well there's no reason that that should be new <laughs> but i didn't know it would be that old like i didn't know it would be the connection with actual with skin and pelts and stuff is is really interesting. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I sort of I sort of love the idea that uh, you might be able to record things on on skin. I mean, technically speaking, people have been recording things on skin for as long as ink has existed. <laughs> yeah, part, just parchment. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I was thinking about tattoos rather than than vellum, but you're you're absolutely right. So, um, and at the end of it all, we have a very fine film. Yeah, exactly. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon.